Hello and welcome to another video. In this one we're going to be talking about singletons, uh, in particular what the singleton pattern is and a couple of different ways to implement it in Python and some kind of pros and cons of each of them. I'll also tell you some opinions that I have about which of these approaches is, is probably the one that I would pick. But anyway, let's jump into it. Okay, so the concept of a singleton is it is a class, well, you can think of it as a class that should only be instantiated once and uh, is global. Now, the singleton pattern is one that I tend to avoid um, because it's really just a sneaky global variable or a sneaky collection of global variables, um, but, but disguised as a, you know, design pattern. Uh, the typical way that you would write this, and, and we'll actually go over like the, the simplest way and, and how you can think about it, is a class that you assign to a module in Python, for instance. Um, in, you know, in Java, for instance, this might be a static class that has static members and like you modify those static members as as the program executes. Um, but it's it's essentially it's essentially global variables, but sneakily hidden. Um, and yeah, I guess we'll get started by just showing some ways to define one in Python. Um, now, note none of these are going to be perfect. Um, <laughs> But they're all going to be kind of approximations of a singleton. So let's just start with a normal class, class foo, and maybe it has a do thing, or I don't know, increment thing, and an initialization, self, self.x equals one, and this does self.x plus equals one. Uh, we can type this if we want as well. Uh, what did I do there? <laughs> Capital int. Oh no! <laughs> I gotta follow her. <laughs> I should really disable that. Um, but it makes my recordings much much more difficult. Uh, this does none and maybe def get thing. I don't know, just a, just a very, very simple class that does something. Return self.x. Um, and you might represent a global singleton of this by having a foo equals foo. And now this is sort of a a global variable it has some state to it so you can modify it and you know as your process runs it you know increments or decrements this value and it, it stays globally um <laughs> this actually reminds me of another reason why singletons are not great uh they're really really hard to test because if you're just working on this global instance here it's really easy to you know break the state of this object such that a future version of this uh, a future test might see a state that it doesn't expect it might expect you know I'm getting a blank world, but really, you know, X has already been incremented a few times. Um, and so it's it's really hard to like test stuff like this. And often it's better to, you know, take these these sort of instances and move them um, into a different place. <laughs> but anyway, this is kind of like the very basics of a singleton pattern where you have, you know, a class and this. Now there's a couple of problems here and we'll, we'll point some of those out. Uh, the first is it's really easy for someone to make another instance of this class, and so it's no longer singleton because you could have multiple instances of it. And so that's that's one property that's usually undesirable about this. Now, one easy fix if you if your team is you know on the same page and you're um, good at adhering to conventions is to underscore prefix this class uh, to kind of give it the indication that this is private. Uh, and that you shouldn't instantiate other copies of this. This also makes it a little bit easier to test because you can import this class and you know make a new new singleton in instance. Um, but you can also you know prevent this from being instantiated in in normal code. Uh, another problem with this is it's really easy to make a extension to this class. So I could make a subclass of this really easily class bar uh, that extends foo, and now suddenly, you know, maybe you instantiate bar and it no longer has the um, the weight of this like <laughs> private class here. And, you know, being able to subclass something is also something you don't want in a singleton. You, you don't really want to be able to subclass something. Um, and one way you can kind of get around that is do from typing import final and you know decorate this class as final saying you know this should not be instantiated in, in or this should not be inherited from uh now of course you can you probably get around that by unwrapping the final and and still instantiating it so it's it's still not perfect um the other thing is like you have for this pattern you have to be very careful about your you know convention here another very simple singleton 
is to just use a module. Um, so let's say, I don't know, foo.py. Uh, and let's take this the same set of functions here, but instead apply them to a module. I actually think this is the most explicit version of this. Um, so you're gonna start x at one. Uh, when we increment thing, we no longer have self here. Uh, we're gonna use global x. And I think this is explicit because it, it definitely tells you, oh yeah, there's, there's global variables going on here. I'm dealing with global state. Um, whereas this is, you know, sneaky global state, sneaky global state. Um, and so you might do something like this as your uh, singleton here. Now note that modules in Python don't usually get copied. You can copy them with reload. And so, you know, this, this breaks down with reload. But again, like the singleton is a bad pattern. So it's really easy to break down the singleton pattern. Um, but, you know, Conventionally, modules are, are essentially super global variables. Usually you treat them as immutable, but this is kind of, you know, modifying attributes of, of the actual module itself. Uh, but this is another approach that you can do. If you want to get super fancy and use some fancy metaprogramming, um, we can do some other stuff. Actually, before we do that, um, one, one other way to kind of hide this class is to instead of having you know this eagerly instantiated maybe it has a side effect and so you don't actually want to run this on module uh import is to make a getter function for this so def get foo uh, maybe we have a foo equals none here and if foo is none uh return foo well actually we would probably want to do global foo uh, foo equals foo, just to instantiate it, and then return foo, uh, otherwise return foo. Or actually we can simplify this and do it like that. Uh, so this gives us kind of a, a getter function to access an, a singleton instance of this. Um, and you would, you know, conventionally not expose this or this because they're underscore prefix. Um, this has all the same problems as, as the other thing, except we're being a little bit more lazy here. Also, if we don't want to run write this kind of gross code, we can hide this behind LRU cache. Funk tools, and so you can do func tools dot LRU cache max size equals one, because we only have one of these. Oh, and of course this returns a foo. And we can just do return foo here. That's kind of a, a cleaner way to write this, this getter function. Um, but again, has all the same downsides as, you know, this class is still technically there, so you could still technically instantiate it. Now, there's a couple more complicated solutions, which I'm going to go over next, uh, which are defining double under new. Um, oh, I forgot about another part, which is, which is kind of um, a little bit unfortunate here, is this class is copyable. So if I, you know, use copy.copy .copy or copy.deep copy, I can actually create a second singleton instance. Um, and they're also pickleable and unpickleable. And so you could use pickle to create a new instance of this class. And so we're gonna presume that our programmers here are you know, not, not nefarious, but you know, if you're, if you're actually trying to prevent a second instance of this class, you would wanna defend against copy, uh, copyability and pickleability. And there are hooks, hooks for both of those to prevent that. Um, but let's do something that makes this class only instantiatable once. And so what we're going to do here is we are going to override double under new. Now double under new gets run before double under init. So uh, it allows you to, um, you know, control the initialization of a class. So if we did def double under new here, uh, new has some, has different parameters, but it returns an instance of itself. I'm quoting this because, you know, I'm still in Python 3.8. Um, and you would want to keep track of, you know, an instance here, a global instance here. So if class.inst is none, uh, then class.inst equals super.new. Uh, and you would pass along any of your arguments that you have here. This is just calling the base class, whatever your base class is. In this case, it's object, so it's not super important. And then finally, you would return class out of here. So that way, Python 3 dash i t down pi, uh, you know, f1 equals foo, you would just call this foo every time. And f1 is f2. Yeah, so we, we get back the same exact instance every time. Uh, f1 dot increment thing. Uh, i 
Why did it not? Why did it? Why did we not? Wait a minute. Why did it not call an hit? Uh, what is F1 here? F1 is the class. Oh, class dot inst. Wait a minute. F1 equals foo. F2 equals foo. F1 is F2. Okay, there we go. So now it's an instance. F1 dot increment thing. And you know, if we somehow had somewhere else accessed F2 and did git thing, we should get two back now. Now one thing that I wonder about this. Yeah, so one unfortunate thing about this pattern is uh, if something goes ahead and re-instantiates this and the instantiation has a side effect, so in this case, like, you know, this self.x, um, you know, already, <laughs> the self.x does a modification here. And so if you were to instantiate a third one, even if uh, those are these are the same object, the double under init is going to rerun after double under new happens. And this is this always happens if the thing that you return here is an instance of the class that you're working on. So you would also want to do something like, um, you know, store some another class variable that's like initted equals false, and you would do, you know, if uh, type self dot initted equals true. Um, if it's true, then you just return out of this, so you prevent it from double initialization. Uh, type self dot initted equals true. So then if we do this now, uh, f1 equals foo, f2 equals foo, f1 is f2, f1 dot increment thing, f3 equals foo, f3 dot get thing. Of course, you know, you can kind of see this is getting more and more gross, but that would be maybe how I would approach this. Um, but again, like this, this adds some complexity here. You, this is very clearly a hack, uh, but this is how you can, you know, return the same instance over and over. So that's that's new. You could also imagine taking this new and this init thing here and splitting it out into a separate base class. Um, but I'm not going to show that here. It's you know not that interesting. Um, the problem is then you have to introduce multiple inheritance and worry about other classes overriding double under new, which would clobber your implementation here. And there's there's all sorts of kind of weird stuff that that happened there. Um, let's talk about another solution, which is similar to this, um, <laughs> where you create a new, well, let's not talk about that one. That one's kind of annoying. You could create a class, you could create a function, uh, decorator, which takes the class and you can build a new class, new class. And this class could have double under new defined inside of it. Uh, class star arcs star star quarks. This is similar to the inheritance way. Um, and then you would just do return new class. And then this this subclass of the class that you pass into this decorator could do the same double or new and double or init um, shenanigans here. But <laughs> I think this one's kind of complicated. Another thing that you might do, uh, one, one thing that would make this simpler is instead of building a new class here, you can build a new, uh, you know, a new function as the result. Um, build instance or get instance and then instantiate this class enclosure inst equals inst equals class and then return inst um, and then return get instance so this replaces you can imagine uh, you know calling this singleton you could have you know at singleton and then class C. And this looks kind of nice. Uh, and then if we call this now, uh, C has no attribute X. Oh, uh, self.x equals one. Uh, and we call C. You can see that we get back the same instance of this class. The problem is now um, C is no longer a class here. It is now this get instance function. And so if you were to do like is instance C1 C, you would get a type error because it's no longer a class. So that one has some problems. Uh, one other approach that you could do here is use a meta class. Of course, meta classes are a bit, you know, 
brain-breakingly complicated, but we can we can make one. Uh, singleton, which extends type, and we're going to give this type a set of instances, which is a dictionary. And when you instantiate a class, it's going to call the callable attribute of your meta class. So we can define double def double under call. Actually, forget the arguments for this. Um, well, we can play with it and see what happens. Breakpoint, and then we can make a class C, which has a meta class of singleton, singleton, and then just define our class as normal. So dot x equals one. Actually, let's call this D, and we'll grab these same methods from up here just to make this happen. So now, uh, this is not going to work for the first part because I haven't actually implemented the meta class yet. Uh, so we call D. Uh, it is called with the class as the first argument. Okay, cool. So we can say, you know, if, and we probably have star star quarks here as well. Um, if class in uh, singleton dot instances. So if we already have it instantiated, uh, actually, we can do, how would we do this? Uh, well, let's just do it the simplest way. There's a more performant way to do this, but um, yeah, class equals singleton.instances.get class if class is not none return. Actually, we can just do this. Let's do it the, the fast way. <laughs> Try return singleton dot instances class so this is the fast path except key error so if it has never been instantiated before then we do ret equals singleton dot instances class equals class star args star star quarks to instantiate it and then return ret and so this double under call gets invoked when i call the class itself uh, so this would get called before double under init um, Actually, I think I might need to do, I think this might recurse. <laughs> I think I might need to actually call double under new and double under init myself manually. Let's see what this does. Uh, yeah, okay, so this, this actually calls itself. So we need to do uh, obj equals class.new then inst or uh, class dot knit obj and then obj. Is that how we do this? I don't know. There's more complicated stuff to the class initialization. Not enough arguments. Oh. Uh, okay. D1 equals D, D2 equals D, D1, D2, D1 is D2. Okay, cool. So this this kind of implements our our you know cached singleton instances here. But of course, you know meta classes are complicated. Maintaining this code is tricky, and I again would not recommend this. For my own personal opinion about how I would implement this, I would stick to the very very simplest thing that you can do here, which is really either you know the the module where you explicitly use globals. Or you just have a class which is conventionally named, and you know you make an instance of it. I think those are the simplest. They're also the most likely to gel nicely with a type checker because you're not doing any, you know, magical meta programming or weird decorators or meta class hackery or or other stuff like that. Um, but you know, this is this is a couple of different ways that you can implement that. Anyway, that's singletons and a bunch of different ways to <laughs> make them in Python. Oh man, oh, this video is so long. <laughs> anyway, if there's other things you want me to explain, leave a comment below or reach out to me on the various platforms. But thank you all for watching and I will see you in the next one. Ah, switch scenes, why?